started mithun yeah yeah i have started you can start all right um, so welcome everyone uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, dr shumantro sharkar with us virtually at least uh, shumantro did his uh, phd uh, did his undergraduate in fact from iit bombay a, a physics department uh, in 2011 he then went on to do a phd from brandeis university um, he was then a postdoc at mit until 2018 and since uh, 2018 he's a postdoc at uh, the los alamo national laboratory so today he's going to tell us about um, understanding the emergence of biological functions from the interactions of molecules um shumantra so uh, before you start uh, so please feel free to ask questions uh, please raise your hand if you want to ask any questions and i'll then um, uh, ask uh, shumantra to answer appropriately thank you Thank you very much, Mitun, uh, and thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to come back to where all, it all started. Um, so, I am interested in biological systems, and uh, I'm not really interested. I'm actually fascinated by biological system because there is incredible amount of diversities uh, that biological systems display, starting at from macroscopic scales like humans and now it is you are seeing with the coronavirus and what not uh and to to the almost to the cellular scale um for example uh when we look at a cell we see that there is an amazing variety of behaviors for example uh in this gif over at the left we see a white blood cell chasing a bacteria and engulfing it and as if it it looks like as if uh actually someone with a sense actually a sense is actually chasing that particular uh bacteria um uh, and then also uh we have stem cells that depending on some kind of external cues changes their functionality and uh changes starting from a stem cell we can get different types of cells in our body and finally cells also reproduce like starting from a single cell you divide into two through mitosis and you get to nearly identical types of uh nearly identical cells and all of these qualities uh gives cells a very life like uh nature and as a result cells have been called the units of life and therefore by studying how a cell functions we can understand a lot about how life functions in general so over the course of last uh, 100 years or so because of tremendous uh, advances in molecular biology what we have uh, come to know is that all cells are made out of different chemicals different nucleic acids such as dna or rna proteins carbohydrates fats small molecules and what have you uh the puzzle sort of is that we understand how all of these individual molecule functions and we have uh, a idea an idea that when all of these molecules come together and interact with each other they give rise to all of this macroscopic behavior however uh the problem or the question is we don't really have a clear understanding uh in so for example uh starting from the microscopic interaction we don't really know how to go to the macroscopic behavior and see if whether these two behavior are consistent with each other or do we have to have a deeper understanding of our microscopic interest of the interactions and this is the question that i will focus on in this talk and in particular i'll show you a couple of ways through which we can actually answer this question so to do that uh let's take a model system um so over here we have the reproduction or the cell division which have been studied in quite detail through biochemical uh assays and molecular biology techniques and what we have understood is that there are hundreds of proteins that are involved in this whole process that gets turned on and turned off at different phases of the cell division process that gives rise to this very characteristic uh growth and then division into two behavior 
Uh, in particular, we can represent the interaction of these cells, uh, these proteins in this diagram that is called a cell signaling network. And we can focus on say this particular part of this cell signaling network, which is called the arc signaling network uh, after this protein in this pathway. And uh, so what is known to us is that this pathway, uh, when by through different types of biochemical techniques, we have come to appreciate that this uh, pathway actually controls the growth rate of these cells. If there is some kind of problem with this pathway, the cell can just die because there is no growth or the, if, the, if it can go in the other direction or grow so fast that it leads to cancer. So a quantitative understanding of this pathway will allow us to understand how a cell grows and divides. Fortunately, uh, current molecular biology techniques are advanced enough to allow us to do this kind of quantitative studies. Uh, over the last 15 or 20 years, a particular technique called optogenetics has been developed that allows us to genetically engineer some proteins inside the cell and allow us to control their amount inside the cell just by shining light, which is pretty cool because, for example, if I tag this source proteins, if I basically engineer it to respond to light, then by shining light on and off, I can control the expression of this protein inside the cell. If the, if the light is on, the amount of this protein is high. If the light is off, then the amount of this protein is low. And then because it is connected to these different other proteins, in particular ARC in this pathway, then we can measure the amount of arc through some other techniques such as fluorescent microscopy and then see how perturbation in the concentration of sauce give rise to the change in arc and by that we can measure or quantify the response of the cell to small perturbations. And what we find out is quite interesting. Um, so for example, when we look at a normal cell uh, that is not cancerous, then you, as you can see, the response is very rapid. As soon as you turn on, the arc signal also turns on very quickly. And as soon as you turn off, it goes down very rapidly. On the other hand, if you look at a cancerous cell, the response time is actually much slower. Uh, and if you can actually quant if you ca you can actually quantify this response time by studying the off kinetics and you see that the half life of the cancerous cell is about 20 minutes whereas for the normal cell it is about 1 minute and in this talk i'll try to show you a couple of ways with which we can actually understand where this type of uh, difference in response coming from in cancerous cells and normal cell by studying the microscopic interaction of the proteins that constitute these pathways. So as I have told you, uh, this ARC pathway is- I had one question. Sure. Yeah, so what kind of response was this? Meaning what is being measured? So the, what you are measuring is the amount of this protein called ARC. So active protein ARC. So as you can see, if you look at this diagram, SOS activates RAS. RAS activates RAF, RAF activates MEC, and MEC activates ARC. So if I have higher qu quantity of sauce, then it activates because of- So it's transcription level, okay. These are, not, these are not transcription level. These are proteins that you tag through fluorescent tags, and then you measure the intensity of the fluorescence. Okay, so when is the intensity high? When you have more protein? When you That's have it. more sauce, yeah. So if I if I look at the red curve, it is if it is high, then there is the blue is also high. If it is low, then the blue is also low. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. So uh, so this pathway, even though it is known to us, yeah, you have a question. No, no. Okay, cool. No, continue. Uh, yeah, so uh, even though this pathway is now uh, known to us, it is not, it is not, it was not known to the experimentalist. Uh, in particular, this particular region was a black box to them. However, however, because we have this knowledge of the intermediate steps in this pathway, we can guess that this 
uh, ras ref interaction, for example, is one of the possible culprits that give rise to this type of uh, difference in behavior between the normal cell and the cancerous cells. Um, and we suspect that ras ref interaction is the uh, culprit it's because that uh, from previous studies, we know that they are involved in almost one third of all known cancers. And in particular for lung cancer, uh, which is the type of cell that is used over here, ras -RAF mutation happens all the time. So we are highly, it is highly probable that ras -RAF interaction is to blame for seeing this type of uh, difference in behavior between a cancerous cell and a normal cell. So it is imperative that we should try to understand what do I mean by ras -RAF interaction and how does that pan out inside a cellular condition? So what exactly is ras -RAF interaction? So when biologists talk about uh, an interaction between proteins or something like that, uh, they don't really mean just the interaction potential. It means all the steps that, uh, that are involved starting from the protein, individual proteins, and then finally going to the functional uh, complex, such as in this case, this uh, RASRAF tetramer called S2F2. And the question about understanding RASRAF interaction is, understanding all the steps that are involved in going from this two individual RAS and two individual RAF to this complex over here. So what we understand about this process is that once this complex forms, it gets phosphorylated and then gets activated because of the phosphorylation. And then it activates downstream protein MEC that I had shown you. And then MEC activates ARC, which is the reporter in this experiment. What we don't know is that whether the formation of S2F2, this complex of two RAS and two RAF, happens through a pathway in which RAS does not dimerize and forms this intermediate complex SF, which then dimerizes to form this complex S2F2, or whether it happens through a pathway in which RAS first dimerizes and then it undergoes through a different transition step and then finally forms this complex S2F2. So this very vague question about understanding ras -RAF interaction becomes very concrete. Uh, and we just need to understand whether RAS dimerizes or not. Uh, and if it dimerizes, what is its physiological impact to understand how ras -RAF interaction impacts physiological behavior? Shumantra, there is a question from Sai. Sai, please ask. Hey, Shwantu, just a quick uh, clarification. Um, mm -hmm. So does, does the particular nature of the interaction play a role downstream in the effects that we're interested in? Like, I somehow missed this little point that you perhaps have made already. Um, and uh, the second question is, on what time scales do these things happen? If I think of chemical reactions with intermediate uh, products forming, mm -hmm. which then can, you know, dissociate or something and form the final product that I'm interested in. I would only be interested in kind of the intermediate products if they have a role to play in basically, you know, photochemistry or something that depends on the application. So I just wanted to know the two things. One is uh, if I take the left path as opposed to the center, as opposed to the right, what impact does it have on the things that we are trying to understand? And the second is uh, what are the time scales involved? So those are the precisely the questions that I'm going to answer in this talk. So if you just wait for a little bit, I'm going to come. Fair to enough. You. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, RAS with finding whether RAS dimerizes or not becomes the central question of understanding RAS ref interaction, and uh, this is this has been um, a, this has been a very important question in the field because, like I said, RAS ref interaction leads to a lot of cancers. So recently, uh, from so there has been an experimental demonstration of RAS clustering uh, by Steve Chu's group in Stanford, uh, in which they use super resolution microscopy uh, to uh, probe this type of RAS-RAS association kinetics. And what they did was they used this molecule called DOX, which actually promotes RAS-RAS association uh, to show that when you increase the concentration of DOX, you tend to see more two or more RAS in a cluster. And if it is concentration is low, then you tend to see mostly single RAS in the cluster. 
So even though this experiment is a very good demonstration of uh, RAS clustering, it is not a good demonstration of RAS dimerization. And the reason is the resolution of this experiment is 20 nanometers. Whereas the RAS proteins, they are typically two to three nanometers in size. So at that resolution, you cannot really distinguish between two RAS that are actually forming a dimer or two RAS that are merely close by within 20 nanometer distance. So as a result, uh, it is not clear whether RAS dimerizes or not. In fact, you can actually show the, uh, this problem by taking a random point pattern like I have done over here at experimental concentration. And you can, by design, say that they do not form any dimer. So all the point points over here are monomers. And when you look at them at the true resolution, you find that all of them are monomers as shown by these blue bars. However, when we look at the system at experimental resolution, we start seeing dimers, which is shown in the green bar, and even trimers, which is shown in the red bar. So what that tells us is that with this type of resolution, we cannot really trust the result uh, that, which claims to show that there is cross dimerization by this kind of super resolution microscopy. And we need more molecular, more high resolution techniques such as molecular simulation to understand and probe whether RAS actually dimerizes or not. The problem with such an approach is that uh, ras ref interaction occurs over multiple time scales uh, in biologically relevant situation. Uh, you can actually make a very uh, good estimate of these time scales uh, by looking at the concentration of RAS and RAF in the cellular uh, systems, which are typically 5 to 100 per micrometer square for RAS and 10 to 200 for, per micrometer cube or micrometer square, depending on where it is, uh, for RAF. And at that concentration and with a diffusion coefficient of about one micrometer square per second, you can show that in two dimensional systems, it is typically collisions between RAS and RAF happen almost once every millisecond to once every second. Whereas once they collide, the interaction and complex formation happen within pico to nanosecond time scale. So there is this huge range in time scale that you need to incorporate in your molecular simulation technique in order to understand the rash of interaction in the biologically relevant condition. So unfortunately, uh, you cannot do that using traditional all atom simulation techniques uh, because these are extremely high resolution techniques. So you can go to angstrom level spatial resolution and femtosecond level temporal resolution. And that gives you a very good estimate of the effective protein-protein interaction potential, as well as the diffusion coefficients of these proteins uh, diffusing on, say, some type of cellular membrane. However, because of this extremely high resolution, uh, using all atom simulation, you cannot really go beyond microsecond timescales for almost all systems. And that leads us to a very interesting conundrum. Because on one hand, we have shown that using experimental techniques, we cannot really probe all of these molecular details of whether RAS dimerizes or not. And on the other hand, we have just shown that traditional molecular simulation cannot really probe that, probe the, this problem in biologically relevant time scale. So how do we bridge this huge gap and answer this question of whether RAS dimerizes or not? So traditional technique has been to probe the, measure the reaction rates from simulations and then use that uh, in some kind of chemical kinetic model to predict long time scale kinetics. However, there are a couple of problems with such an approach. Uh, number one is that as I have shown in the last slide, uh, reaction rates measured from all atom simulations are not really uh, representative of biological systems. And number two is to get to really long time scale, uh, predict long time scale kinetics, chemical kinetic model uh, in its traditional form completely eschews any spatial information. And as a result, we lose important details such as correlation, spatial correlation introduced by polymerization or clustering, and even something like uh, compartmentalization due to different biological uh, entities. 
So as a result, we cannot really use a chemical kinetic model in its traditional form to predict long time scale kinetics, at least for our problem. So we propose to use an alternate approach in which we measure effective potential energies and free energies between different proteins from all atom simulation. And we also measure diffusion coefficients from these type of simulations, which are extremely accurate and then use that in some type of mesoscopic simulation technique to predict long time scale kinetics. And the particular mesoscopic simulation technique that we're going to use is called GFRD. And GFRD is unique because it can preserve the spatial uh, correlation and can accurately get long time scale kinetics without losing important microscopic details. So let me give you a brief resume of uh, Green's function reaction dynamics. So Green's function reaction dynamics has been developed over the last 10 years or so uh, in the groups of Peter Ryan Tenvolde in Amsterdam. And the basic premise of uh, this uh, Green's function reaction dynamics is that biomolecular simulations or rather biomolecular experiments in in vitro systems are extremely dilute and the effective interaction between biomolecular systems is extremely short ranged. So when you have these two assumption, it allows you to group the, mo the molecular interactions or molecular dynamics propagation into two groups. Uh, because of the diluteness, very few molecules are close to each other. And when they are close to each other, you propagate them using traditional molecular mechanics algorithms, such as all atom simulation or Brownian dynamics or any of the tremendous varieties that you have over there. And on the other hand, because of the diluteness, uh, most of the molecules are actually far apart from each other so that they are beyond the interaction range of each other. And at that, with that condition, you can treat each of these molecules as independent particles and propagate them using the Green's function of their free diffusion, which is an event-driven algorithm. And then by combining this clever, uh, cl by cleverly combining this all atom simulation, this molecular simulation at short scale and event driven simulation at long scale, you can achieve same amount of accuracy as a traditional brute force molecular dynamics algorithm at a much, much higher efficiency. For example, when you use GFRD uh, and if you do brute force molecular simulation, uh, then at GFRD for low concentration, say nanomolar regime, which is relevant for biological systems, you can get almost a million times speed up compared to the brute force simulation, which is extremely useful for uh, studying biomolecular systems such as ours, because then we can probe second time scale. However, uh, this type of acceleration co do come at a cost. And that is, as I have mentioned, Green's function reaction dynamics is a mesoscopic simulation technique. And to do so, we have to uh, let go some of the high resolution uh, that we get uh, in traditional molecular all atom simulations. For example, in Green's function reaction dynamics or GFRD. Uh, Shumantra, there is a Hi, Sumantra. So can I ask a question? Sure. So uh, here you said that, you know, you look at the limit where your um, concentration is very dilute. Mm -hmm. But even if the global concentration is small, you can have like system which phase separate and coarsen over a long time. Yeah. There, this might, um, this may not be that efficient, right? Exactly. For that, you need to use special techniques. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but for the problem that I'm going to talk about today, you don't need to use that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so as I was uh, mentioning, um, so GFRD, for GFRD, you need to let go some of the fine resolution. And in fact, you have to represent uh, these proteins as a sphere. Uh, the radius of the sphere is, uh, is basically uh, commensurate with the structure of the proteins. For example, in our case, for RAS, it is about two nanometer in size, whereas for RAF, it is about three nanometer in size. Uh, even though we have to use a sphere to represent this protein, uh, we can actually use an isotropic interaction to model the different types of specific interaction that the protein has. We, there is no limitation in doing that. However, uh, 
uh, what we find out is that we can actually uh, use. So can I ask a question, Sumanta? Here. Yeah. So. Uh... Hello. We attach to specific domains, right? Uh, so Dibendu, you were lost. You I, you cut off for the first half. Can you repeat the question? I am saying that when uh, you know the, you have all the all the microscopic details of the proteins, the idea mm -hmm. is that uh, there are uh, sort of docking sites of one protein with respect to the other. When they come together, they attach. Yeah. Right? Now, when you have these spheres, how mm -hmm. do you incorporate those things in the spheres? I mean, do you uh, have regions or patches on the sphere which are particularly you know uh, have more affinity to each other than other other regions of the sphere yes uh, so we we i'm not going to do that in this talk but what we are doing right now is introducing patches like you may have heard of these things called patchy particles so uh, what we do is we are going to have small regions on the surface of the spheres uh, which will interact strongly with another small region in okay. other sphere. So through this type of anisotropic interaction, we can introduce this type of docking behavior and all of these things. Okay. And if I understand correctly, just a while back you were telling, so the diffusive part, you will do some sort of an event-driven algorithm, is it? Yes, that is right. Okay. And the events would be like, what sort of events? Can you little bit clarify, I mean, what? Exactly. Yeah. So the events are essentially uh, we are looking at uh, diffusive escape problems. Uh, for example, uh, so in molecular simulation. Uh, so so in molecular simulations, uh, what most of the time is spent in actually propagating the particles from one place to another uh, through diffusion. So what this event-driven simulation does is instead of diffusing this particle through molecular simulation, we are going to compute the next uh, position where the particle will, will diffuse by computing the Green's function. Okay. So, and then we are going to uh, propagate them after that time. So this, so you just mean the plain diffusive Green's function, right? Yes, exactly. Plain oh. diffusive. Yeah. Okay. So Fine. when they, we can use this type of Green's function only when they are not interacting and far apart from each other. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so thank you for the question. So so we don't like I have I was telling that for this problem we don't really have to use anisotropic interactions because uh, so there had been some measurements of the effective potential between RAS and RAF and we found out that these interaction potentials are typically isotropic and you can represent them quite well using Leonard Jones uh, which is an attractive interaction or WCA which is an isotropic soft repulsive interaction and this is what we are going to use. Uh, when modeling with GFRD. In addition, uh, we also need to define the intermediate steps going from the monomers to the final complex. In brute force molecular simulations, you do not really have to do that because the interaction and between the proteins takes care of that fact. However, we need to specify what are the intermediate steps uh, in GFRD simulation. Uh, but we can do it very easily. For example, in this hypothesis where there is no, uh, no uh, RAS dimerization, we're going to represent the intermediate steps through this sort of reactions uh, in which S plus F gives SF and SF plus SF gives you S to F2, where S is RAS, F is RAF. Similarly, for this pathway, we're going to represent it using this set of reactions. And in both pathways, we are going to represent the activation reaction using the same set of reactions. In addition, we also have a third hypothesis. Uh, and to do that, we note that in cell, uh, we can actually have both sets of reactions. It's just that cell may choose preferentially one hypothesis over the other, depending on the biological situation. So we are going to study all of these three hypotheses using GFRD and try to understand what is the physiological consequences of these three different hypotheses. So let's take a look at how GFRD simulation occurs in practice. And we are simulating hypothesis one in which RAS does not dimerize. So here we have a one micrometer by one micrometer two dimensional box with periodic boundary condition. And uh, the molecules, like I mentioned, are 
typically two to three nanometers in sizes. So they are actually this tiny dot at the center of this larger disk. And these larger disks are the region over which I can treat this particle, for example, this particle over here, uh, as an independent particle and propagate them using this Green's function event-driven technique. And at the end of this event-driven simulation, as you will see, the particle, particle will propagate to the boundary and this domain will get popped and you will create a new domain until there is an interaction when we will propagate them using molecular mechanics, using Brownian dynamic simulation with a time step of 0.1 nanosecond. So now I'm going to show you the first 100 steps of this simulation. As you can see over here, uh, even though the time step is 0.1 nanosecond, because of this event-driven technique, we are jumping almost hundreds of microseconds in each individual step. And as I had mentioned, you can see that this event, event domains are actually getting popped and reformed. And in this way, the particles are propagating through the space uh, in a very, very uh, fast manner. And this is extremely uh, useful because for this type of system, which is biologically relevant, we can actually change microscopic information and then can probe the consequences, its macroscopic consequences, uh, consequences within a very short time. For example, I did this simulation that I just showed you uh, up to 10 seconds of time scale uh, on my laptop within a day. And, and, if, and for that, we had a microscopic time scale of 0.1 nanosecond. So it gives you tremendous control over changing microscopic interaction and at the same time allows you to probe its macroscopic consequences in very short amount of time. So therefore, now we can actually probe uh, macroscopic physiological parameters such as activation time scale of S2F2 and by changing different types of microscopic quantities such as the fact that whether RAS dimerizes or not, and we are going to do that by changing the of protein concentrations of different proteins. And to do that, we run this set of experiments in which we control the RAF concentrations. Uh, we fix the RAF concentrations to these three values and we change the RAS concentration. And in the absence of RAS dimerization, which is hypothesis one, we find out that for all RAF concentrations, the activation time, which is plotted over here, actually decays with increasing RAS concentration. This is something that we expect because uh, well, as the concentration of RAS is increasing, it leads to more collision and more collision means more product formation and more product formation, more SDF2 formation, more SDF2 formation means more activation. So that is kind of consistent with our expectation. However, for hypothesis two and three, where we have RAS dimerization, we see a rather striking behavior. So at high concentration of RAF, we see behavior that is similar to hypothesis one. However, uh, at low RAF concentration, we see the exactly the opposite behavior. In this case, uh, the, the activation time scale, instead of decreasing with increasing RAS concentra concentration, now actually increases with increasing RAS concentration. And that tells us that there must be some kind of fundamental processes that are happening in the presence of RAS dimerization that is giving rise to this type of anomalous behavior. And we found out that there is a very interesting behavior and that happens due to resource limitation. And in particular, yeah. Sorry, Samantha, uh, just, uh, uh, if you, could you go back one slide? Sure. Yeah, so what is the, uh, so just a quick clarification, what is the reason that the, uh, I expect the error bars to be larger for smaller concentration from some kind of vague intuition about, uh, about uh, measurements, but why is it that the error bars are larger on the right hand side than they are on the left hand side, even though the, they are just two qualitatively different hypotheses? Next slide. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so. Basically for hypothesis one, which was on the left-hand side uh, and there, where there were no RAS dimerization, free RAF, which is in limited quantity at low concentration, uh, is used only in a single reaction that directly goes to form S2F2. So when you measure the activation time scale, we see that there's the distribution of activation time scale, which is shown by the red scatter plot over here. 
uh, is very compact. It doesn't really, uh, it first of all, the mean value actually decays with increasing concentration and the distribution is very compact. However, for hypothesis two, free RAF is used in two different reactions. And as a result, when you increase the RAS concentration, this intermediate step can act as a hoarding mechanism that doesn't let free, that doesn't release free RAF and let this form it, let, let to the formation of S2F2. As a result, what you see is that sometime at high concentration, you do see activation reaction and sometime you do not see any activation reaction. So you get this type of bimodal behavior in the activation process that gives rise to this large spread in the activation time scale. And this is what happens even for hypothesis three. And because of this bimodality of the distribution, when you measure the mean uh, activation time, you see that the activation time actually increases with increasing RAS concentration. Does that answer? One question. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh... Aren't the free energy changes of these individual reactions known already? Because I mean, the, I mean, since you are considering different hypotheses, mm -hmm. uh, I thought if you knew the free energy changes of the reaction, then you could have said that no, this happens, that does not happen at the individual reaction level. Like whichever will have a more free energy gain that will win. So why can't we use that kind of argument to rule out not this but this? Uh, the main problem which I have mentioned is the, the time scale that is involved in the formation of these products. Uh, I mean, if I go back a couple of slides, so you can see that S2F2 starts forming only about at 10, uh, like about 10 millisecond or so time scale, whereas SF, like a single SF forms at about uh, in the hundreds of microsecond timescales. So these type of timescales cannot be probed using traditional molecular simulation techniques such as umbrella sampling or so uh, that can give you uh, this the free energy profile. So, uh, I mean, this type of studies cannot be done no, for biology. I mean, yeah. experimentally that if- Oh, I mean, okay. If, yeah, if, so if experiment experimentally, the endothermic or exothermic depending on those things. So the problem is, uh, this type of reactions uh, can, for so the only way we can probe the product formation is through uh, either, uh, so there is no calorimetric measurement for this type of biological systems, at least to the level that where you can probe individual reactions. I mean, I know that for chemical reactions, you can do that, but as far as I am aware that for cell signaling reactions, which occur extremely uh, slowly uh, compared to traditional chemical reactions, um, I don't think there is any calorimetric information, but this is something I, uh, I, I okay. could be done later. So, so the cool thing is now that we have uh, this idea that uh, when we have rust dimerization at low concentrations, we are going to get um, an increase in the activation time scale, which will delay downstream processes, presumably. And that allows us to make a very uh, interesting hypothesis. In particular, we can now explain, uh, hypothesize rather, about the observation, the off-kinetics that we had seen in the experiment. In particular, we hypothesize that uh, in normal cells, the activation, the propagation of the signal happens through a pathway in which rest does not dimerize. Uh, which at re biologically relevant concentrations, which is over here, gives rise to very rapid response of the cells. On the other hand, uh, in cancerous cells, uh, it is possible that it happens because of the mutation of RAS, uh, it tends to dimerize and it gives rise to different types of resource limited behavior that delays the off kinetics of these cancerous cells. But this is a hypothesis that needs to be probed using actual experiments. And in fact, uh, we also, need to uh, be a bit more quantitative and show in more biologically relevant situation in which RAS and RAF interactions are regulated by many other proteins uh, inside the cell. So uh, can I ask a question, Sumantra? Yeah. The, uh, the, in the cancerous cell, when something is observed that you know the response is slow, one other hypothesis could have been that the RAS and the RAF themselves, these proteins have undergone some sort of um, you know, deformation or uh, any sort, it is a disease cell, you know, so these proteins themselves could have been, uh, so is it known that the RAS and the RAF as such remains in their old 
sort of uh, structural uh, sort of uh, things um, those are preserved for example other kinds of diseases it is known for example uh, you know proteins they they sort of coagulate and all kinds of things happen so is it i mean yeah. those are so it's a very interesting question right? yeah yeah so what we know what we know uh, is that actually the opposite thing happens instead of ras becoming uh, uh, just changing its conformation so that ras ref interaction does not happen it actually goes into a conformation in which it always stays active and binds to ref so that's why the puzzle remains as to why does even though ras is always active why does it lead to a slow down in the cancerous cell does it answer your question yeah yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you yeah so uh, so the inter- so the, the under i mean that is that is a very interesting good question because it allows me to segue into the second part because what is probably happening is this type of resource limited behavior uh, because of different regulation that ras and rab goes through through all of these proteins that i'm showing over here the problem is we cannot really use gfrd just like we did to probe the system because as ragu mentioned at that limit uh, we go into a very dense soupy cellular system and gfrd stops being efficient so however what we can now do is to take an alternative approach uh, in which we are going to use each of these individual protein measure their interaction potentials by doing all atom simulation and then simulate their binary interaction like interaction between two different proteins at biologically relevant concentrations using gfrd then measure the reaction rates from this simulation and then use the chemical kinetic model to predict long time scale kinetics and this will allow us to capture some of the uh, contributions of the spatial correlations that we get uh, um, in this type of biological systems uh before i go into that let me give you a brief resume of chemical kinetic equations so chemical kinetic equations probe the time evolution of concentrations of uh, say a molecule c by uh measuring the propensities uh it, of different reaction for example if r1 is the propensity of reaction 1 and propensity r2 is the propensity of reaction 2 then its difference gives you the time evolution of concentration of c and these propensities can be uh written as the product of reaction rate kappa and mass action phi and reaction rate is typically assumed to be constant however what we find out for our system is that the reaction rates are actually not constants and they actually depend on the mass action phi and because mass action phi depends on concentration the the reaction rate actually depends on the concentrations of these molecules and when you put all of them together in a single plot you see that they all fall in a master curve that tells you that the underlying reason for this concentration dependence is uh, a unique quantity and we suspect that diffusion in 2d is probably the underlying reason uh, as i had mentioned the collision the diffusive collisions between these uh, proteins happen in millisecond time scale and therefore when you look at the uh, diffusive rate kd it is of the order of once every millisecond or so whereas the the interaction after collision happens within nanosecond to picosecond so therefore the interaction rate ki is actually much much higher than the diffusive uh, collision rate so when you measure the reaction rate constant which is a harmonic mean of these two reaction rates it is effectively given by the diffusive transport rate so therefore we suspect that diffusion is the underlying reason to test that we basically use some model reactions which is the homodimerization and the heterodimerization and simulated that using gfrd using identical condition that we did for the previous rasraf interaction case and because gfrd can probe millisecond and sorry seconds and tens of second time scale we can get enormous uh, statistics uh, with which we can actually plot the distribution for example for uh, at for this to make this uh, distributions of dimerization time interval we got 100000 different dimerization events that you can not really get using all atom simulations uh, 
And when we do that, we get this very interesting shaped dimerization time intervals that has an exponential decay at long time scale, but has parallel decay at shorter time scale. And this parallel decay happens because of short time correlation that happens because of immediate rebinding after a dissociation event. Because these are spatially explicit, what happens is that you have a molecule that binds then dissociates and then immediately rebinds. And that gives rise to this type of power law behavior. And that at longer time scale, because of rebinding event at longer time scale, you start getting this type of uh, uh, power law at, at the intermediate time scale. However, we are interested in the long time scale exponential decay because by fitting an exponential function, we can now measure the propensities as a function of different concentrations which I have shown over here. Uh, and when you measure the reaction rate kappa uh, as a function of concentration uh, by from these propensities, you see that it, the reaction rate kappa actually changes with concentration of the uh, monomer A. And that tells, gives us credence to the idea that diffusion in two dimension is probably the underlying reason. Furthermore, uh, we actually repeated the same set of experiments for different reactions and for different types of microscopic interaction potentials. And for each one of them, we found out that there is this type of concentration dependence of the, of the microscopic reaction rate kappa. And interestingly, this behavior, this functional dependence of kappa on the mass action phi is very similar to what we have found out in the RASRAF case, which kind of proves with, without any doubt that diffusion in 2D is the underlying reason for this type of concentration dependent reaction rates. And the uh, interesting thing is that fu this functional dependence can be represented very simply by using kappa naught, which is the small phi limit of kappa and a function f of phi that, that shows uh, its functional dependence on phi. And to measure this functional dependence f, we measured kappa phi minus kappa naught for all of these three different cases as a function of phi. And look for low concentrations that we had probed over here, we found out that uh, it varies as phi to the power one third. So if so that we can write f of phi approximately as kappa one times phi to the power one third for low phi values. And in fact, we can approximate kappa one by defining a scale phi naught at which it is equal to kappa naught. So that when you can write kappa phi in this very succinct form, kappa naught plus kappa naught times phi by phi naught to the power one third. In fact, we can take this okay, relation- If I can just ask one quick question. Can you go yeah. back uh, one more slide? Why does the dimerization uh, points look different to all the others, the S2 uh, in this graph? The points corresponding to S2 look to have a different trend. Than this one compared to this one compared to this one? Well, the right-hand side curve. Uh, OK, yeah. So the, they look different because, you know, first of all, if you look at this curve, homodimerization for uh, Leonard Jones potential has a very different dependence than uh, for uh, WCA potential. Similarly, if you compare heterodimerization with homodimerization, they have very different functional dependence. But nowhere and, does it seem to decrease, right? Which it seems to do on- Oh, your... the, the over here? Okay, so that I believe is due to numerical error. So here, you know, uh, we had, uh, so when, ten, when phi is about 10 power one, you know, there are three or four proteins over there. So unless you have large number of statistics, you cannot really, uh, get good data, good uh, reaction rate over here. Unfortunately, because we did tens of seconds of simulation for this complicated system, we did not have enough data. And that's why we have this kind of scatter over here. I see. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so where were we? So we basically had this approximate relationship for kappa of phi at small phi values. And now uh, we can actually make an empirical relation that will extend it to uh, larger phi values. To do that, uh, we note that kappa of phi cannot increase indefinitely with the phi values and it must saturate at some kappa max value, at a maximum value that we call kappa max. Uh, 
And in fact, using that postulate, we can write this uh, empirical form, which you can uh, test has same behavior at small phi values as this uh, experimental relationship that we got from simulate by fitting simulation data. And furthermore, you can actually see that when we use this empirical relationship for different curves, just by changing phi naught values, we can get an exact fit. And that tells us that this relationship probably holds for larger phi values, but we need to uh, actually do more simulation to uh, actually prove that. For the time being, we are going to use this empirical relationship as an hypothesis. Uh, one of the first thing that we are going to understand is how can we get kappa max. So kappa max can be gotten very easily by noting that when phi is much, much greater than phi naught, the diffusive transport rate is much higher than the intrinsic rate so that uh, the reaction rate is actually maxed, it actually maxes out at the reaction limited rate of Ki, which can, we can then use as kappa max. And once we have that, we can now use this empirical relationship to probe how it affects the reaction kinetics in biomolecular system. So this is something that we are going to do. Understand by studying the consequences of concentration dependent rate on a simple system, such as lotka voltage operator pre dynamics. So lotka voltage operator pre dynamics uh, consists of these three reactions in which you have an autocatalytic growth of the prey, uh, a decay, a death of the predator Y, and only one single association reaction, which is the predation reaction through which Y grows and forms 2Y. And you can write it down um, as a chemical kinetic equation in which alpha is the growth rate of the prey, beta, gamma is the death rate of the predator Y, and beta is the predation rate. Uh, of the X of the prey. And if beta is concentration independent, as we have solved in many nonlinear dynamics scores, we know that as a function of alpha and gamma, we always get oscillation in the steady state. Creator and prey concentration always oscillates. So that we are going to say that in the concentration independent case, we are always going to see robust oscillation. Now let's see what happens when we have concentration dependence. We are going to use our relationship. And in particular, we are going to use this approximate form, beta one times phi to the power delta to do analytical, a perturbative analysis for small phi. And when we go through the same steps that you probably know and love, such as doing linear stability analysis of the chemical kinetic equation, finding the Jacobian through this analysis and then finding the eigenvalues, we see that the concentration dependence do come into the eigenvalues. In particular, when the, there is no concentration dependence, such as delta is equal to zero, we get back what we had just shown, that is robust oscillation for all alpha and gamma values. However, when delta is not equal to zero, we see oscillation only when for alpha equal to gamma. That tells us that a behavior that was robust in the absence of concentration dependence can become fine-tuned when there is concentration dependence of the association reactions. In particular, we also find out that uh, when depending on these parameters alpha and gamma, now you can get explosive growth and collapse so that we have an unstable fixed point and also decay to a steady value, which is that there is a stable fixed point. And that tells us that it, for this kind of simple system, we get this transition from robust to fine-tuned behavior. And that implies that in more complicated cellular system, there may be more interesting uh, changes in from robust to fine-tuned behavior that will lead to very like switch-like behavior in this kind of complicated scenarios that might also lead to this type of different uh, kinetic behavior between cancerous or normal cells. This is something we are in the process of understanding. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have any data to show you, but this is something that I'll be able to show you in the future. With that, a couple of key takeaways from my talk. So what we wanted to do in this talk is to understand the macroscopic physiological 
behavior of a biological or any system, a complicated chemical system, by changing the microscopic behavior of the system. In the process, by doing uh, this hierarchical multi-scale simulation called GFRD, and by doing a direct simulation, we showed that the, whether a rash dimerizes or not can be probed and there is a physiological consequences of this microscopic uh, variation in the pathways. Furthermore, uh, we also showed that uh, we, when the system is more complicated than a single isolated system, we can quantify the reaction kinetics. And we found out that it leads to concentration dependent rates in two dimensional system where most of these biological reactions take place. And that leads to fine tuned behavior where, which we typically expect to be robust. Carrying forward, we are going to use all of these insights and intuition to probe many different behavior. Some of these we have already started doing, such as in the cell signaling systems, we are studying cytosolic exchanges and clustering of membrane proteins and how that actually affects uh, this type of ras rap interaction. So RAS is known to cluster, and we are asking how clustering can lead to RAS changes in the ras rap interaction. We are studying how molecular heterogeneity can affect cell signaling, such as if, for example, that we have found out that diffusion coefficient of individual RAS can vary depending on the lipid environment. And we have found out that it has very interesting consequences on the macroscopic uh, physiological behavior. We are also probing how active transport, such as transport through molecular motors can change signaling uh, behavior of this type of, in this type of signaling network. Uh, but this is something that I'll be able to show you uh, next time I visit. On the self-assembly front, which is uh, still a work in progress, we are studying how cluster forms and uh, disassembles by using techniques that are different than self different than GFRD. And I am using my knowledge uh, from PhD in granular materials to probe how assembly and disassembly happens for small cluster of molecules in this type of uh, biological systems, such as press. So with that, I would like to thank my group and my funding agencies, and I'll be happy to take any questions. And if you have any questions beyond, you can contact me in this email. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't hear you if you are saying anything. Sorry, I got disconnected. Uh, is anyone asking? Okay, so Shumantra, I just had one question. So you see, Dibendu had asked this about uh, the structure, uh, modification of structure leading to these different time scales. Is there any way to say that? Is there any way? To, and you are saying that no, that's not the reason. But uh, you know, this a different mechanism that you are proposing. Is there any way to go back and confirm that this is because I don't know. There could be many other possibilities that could lead to this different time scale. So, is there a way to show that you know this is this uh, the second pathway that you are proposing that is causing this difference in the time scales? Um, so one of the easiest and the direct way will be to actually change the microscopic uh, hypothesis, right? So we can hypothesize that RAS is like, so the Bendu before that the Bendu asked, is there any specific talking like mechanism? So, uh, and for those systems, we can actually say that the, there is some kind of uh, mechanism that does not let these dogs to face each other. So that in the cancerous cell, it, points away from the RAF docking position. And in by changing that kind of microscopic properties, we can now test the consequences uh, uh, of how ras raf interaction occurs at physiological timescales. I see. OK. Um, anyone else? Um, if not, uh, I think we can thank Shumantro for a very nice seminar. Um, so thank you, Shumantra. Uh,
Thank uh, you. I'm sure people can get in touch if there are any further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Shomu, do I need to do anything else? No, that, that's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Shumantra. Thank you.